Well, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Zittrain. I have the honor of teaching cyber law in these parts. And I also have the distinct honor of introducing Siva Vaidhyanathan, who uh, is, I guess his official bio doesn't quite capture just how amazing uh, he is because it only makes him look like a professor, which, you know, that's great and all that. Um, but when you say professor of media studies, he's actually mastered media studies in the sense of having appeared successfully on the John Stewart show <laughs> on the one hand, and also has sort of become the darling of Glenn Beck on the other hand in ways that I will let him explain. But let's just say that this <laughs> book has found purchase in many places, including those sometimes thought of as inhospitable to intellectual argument. <laughs> and that said, rather delicately, one of the amazing virtues of Siva is you know exactly where he stands. I wouldn't call him doctrinaire, he's not, but I would say that he speaks lucidly, plainly, straightforwardly, and in the best of ways, iconoclastically. This is not somebody looking to make friends ahead of establishing what is true. And I think uh, you'll see that present in the presentation today and the questions and answers that follow. Uh, a few logistical notes. This is being not live webcast, but recorded. Then will later be put on a webcast, indexed six ways from Sunday by Google, and pushed to the bottom of the search results. <laughs> but you should be aware that should you participate in some way in the proceedings today, you could find yourself forever on the internet. Um, and uh, the book is available in the back of the room uh, for $25, hello, hello. And uh, am I right, Siva, that you'd be willing to sign the Happy book sign. in some way? So um, with that, we're gonna hear about 40 minutes from Siva, then question and answer. And uh, I'm just glad that dogpile didn't end up being the thing that took off, because then it would be the dogpileization yeah. of everything. <laughs> and that just wouldn't be as credible. So. Uh, Anyway, with that, I give you Siva Vaidhyanathan. Thank, Thank you, you Siva. So Wonderful, thanks. Well, th this is, uh, it's always a thrill and an honor uh, to speak uh, at a Berkman event uh, and to speak at HLS. Um, uh, sad to see that even though HLS has managed to take over two branches of government, it has not taken over the clouds and does not yet dictate the weather. So, uh, but I understand people at MIT are working on that and they're very close. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, so weird stuff going on uh, in the universe. Um, uh, last week, Monday and Tuesday, uh, Glenn Beck went on a, a two-day tirade against Google. And of course, he, you know, he drew his thing on the board connecting um, you know, Google to Obama. And, uh, and of course, he has all these stories of a number, handful of people, friends of ours, and you probably know them, who have gone back and forth between the executive branch and Google. And of course, the omnipresent George Soros, the, the, um, uh, the wizard behind the curtain uh, of all that is um, left-wing and dangerous in the world. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he was explicitly urging people not to use Google because I, I, I try, uh, believe me, it's hard for me to unpack the arguments. Um, I want anyone to say their arguments. Right? There's no argument, there's just a drawing of lines. But it has something to do with the fact that um, both Soros and uh, Google, um, or at least Sergey Brin are um, supporting uh, some NGOs that are trying to uh, empower people in Sub-Saharan Africa to make their lives better, uh, and this apparently, uh, and there there may be some U.S. government support as well. So this apparently is the root of some sort of left-wing takeover of the world. Um, uh, yeah, if only it were that easy. But um, so that I mean, I was really scared that somehow people would start attaching my work to this um, paranoid uh, anti-Google tirade. And, and what I found was uh, I have a number of uh, radio interviews um, that I've done in the past two weeks and then scheduled in the future. And I'm getting an increasing number of invitations from AM drive time talk. And some of the hosts are, um, they're not quite willing to articulate, and I'm sure that's the wrong verb, the <laughs> the Glenn Beck position, uh, but they are poking at the notion that Google stands in for some sort of um, element of the elite that secretly runs our culture and uh, determines our, uh, our value system. And that actually, the way they express it, 
um, scares me because I hope I don't say it that way. Um, but I could see how it could, my argument could actually be misinterpreted or attached to that. Because the reason I wrote this book is, um, well, there are a number of reasons, and I'm going to get through them. But, but, but fundamentally, um, I started growing concerned around 2004 uh, that the audacity of the company and the brilliance of the company and the success of the company and the ease of use and the, uh, and the pure pleasure of using its service. And really, it's fun, right? It's fun. And it, ha it was fun in 2000 to use this, uh, this service that, you know, for which we write no checks. Now, I often point out to my students, you probably love Google because you write no checks to Google, and we hate Comcast because we write checks to Comcast. And that's not that simple, but that's, it's a factor, right? Um, and and, and I, I grew increasingly concerned that we were allowing one company to influence heavily our value system, what was true, what was relevant in Google's terms, right? That's the term of art for search engines, relevance. Um, uh, what was valuable, um, what mattered in the world. And, 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 and my concern, of course, is tempered by the fact that I'm in awe of the decisions that went into making sense of the web. And that's fundamentally what Google has done for us, because the web was nonsense before a decent search engine. Right? It was like webby in the worst possible way. You had to hope you found the first page from which to launch your, um, your meanderings, your surfing, and then follow a series of links and hope you could reconstruct the tra trail later and recommend URLs to people. Uh, and, and that was a lot of work. Uh, and it was not always uh, easy to uh, uh, replicate the trail. Um, uh, and so the notion that knowledge was actually usable pre-Google uh, was, was hard to imagine. It actually was um, as new as it was and as cool as it was, we needed this rather amazing insight uh, that fed into Google's um, original PageRank algorithm uh, to help us navigate and make sense of the web. Um, and so I, this is one of those problems that fascinates me. Right? Here's a fundamentally good thing for us, and a fundamentally good thing, I think, for the world. And yet, there is reason to worry. And that's why I chose worry instead of panic. You know. Um, and, and I, I think there's a real difference between worrying and panicking, right? Um, uh, when you worry, you are allowed to think, right? You allow yourself to think. When you panic, you shut down all thought. Um, and so now I find myself in this weird position of trying to move panic to worry. Uh, and also, in some ways, minimize the edges to worry. Because I want, more than anything, to have a more thoughtful conversation about our information ecosystem in every way. And Google is a beautiful place to start that conversation because it touches so many different areas of our information ecosystem. Now, I said I wanted to explain for a few reasons why I wrote this book. And oh, it took five years to write this book. Um, not that I was writing every minute of those five years. Of course, it'd be a much longer book. It'd be like, like Jonathan's book. Um, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. It would, it's, a, it's like, you know, it's, it's about half the size of Jonathan's book. Not half as good, by the way. But it's, um, it is a book that took a tremendous amount of false starts uh, to, to, to really make it work, um, largely because Google does something new and big and special every month that's worthy of attention, until the point I had to actually sort of write that whole thing off and say, I cannot keep track of all that Google wants to do. It cannot be my job. I can't write a biography of the company. But I want to look at some big themes that might still be relevant five years from now, because the last thing you want to do is write a book that doesn't matter five years from now, because you might as well write a website um, or something else that, that has that sort of temporality and disposability. Um, so that was a huge challenge. The other challenge is I became a father five years ago. And it turns out, I don't know if you know this, but having little kids is really bad for writing books. They're, <laughs> they're really no help at all. Um, uh, in my case, and it may not be universal, but my daughter needed you know, attention and kept saying, feed me change me, 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 me. Uh, and there really was no, no real time to sort of play around with ideas and, and work at long stretches. Uh, my dog was a great help. She just sat right there at my feet. But the kid, no. So now she's five, and, and, she's, and now she's thrilled that I'm done. You know? And she, she's actually um, uh, decided that Google is a person. And I overheard her tell one of her friends, um, uh, my, my papa flew to California and met Google at a party. 
Um, so I, and I haven't disabused her of this, right? Because my, my wife won't let me uh, 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 explode her Santa Claus fantasies. Um, it's a bone of contention in our marriage. So I'm going to hold on to the Google as a person fantasy as long as I can and retribution. And then we can destroy her, uh, uh, convince her that both her parents are liars at some point. Um, uh, but in that process, now she has uh, demanded that uh, I, I write no more grown-up books. Uh, my next book has to be about a hippopotamus who travels to all 50 states. So um, that's my next project. Um, but a, another inspiration for this grown-up book uh, came from our friend, Yochai, who uh, uh, had a sentence near the end of The Wealth of Networks. And this is the sentence, right? Because The Wealth of ne Networks is a tremendously optimistic work. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a long and detailed case about fundamental transformations in power and perhaps wealth over time. And it, it makes the case, I think fairly convincingly, um, that many of the assumptions that we've been bringing to discussions of political economy for a couple of centuries are now under some serious pressure uh, because for if, for no other reason, scarcity of some of our important activities and resources is no longer a factor. But he, and, and of course he's thrilled by the rise of decentralization in terms of knowledge distribution. But he warns, things could easily change, right? He's certainly not going to be um, uh, fooled by this, this idea that as the internet has been or as our information ecosystem has been, it must always be. And he raises this warning near the end of the book. And so, Reading this sentence when the book came out, <clears throat> I started thinking that very question. I, th I thought this is something worth following. I didn't know that I wanted to write a book at this moment, but I knew this was something to pay attention to. And soon after that, of course, we started learning about Google's project to scan in millions of books from libraries around the world. And that seemed to me to be a, a perfect example of hubris uh, and, and something we should watch very closely because from the moment of its announcement, one did not have any idea how it would end up. And I think we all know that it has not ended up as it was originally described. So it also occurred to me as I was reading around about Google that, that not enough people understood that this is Google's corporate mission statement, right? To organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. This terrifies me, uh, frankly. Uh, it terrifies me that any company would assume that it has that goal and that ability within its um, talent pool, within its uh, collection of, of brilliant people. Um, and it terrifies me because, I don't know, I'm, you know, we're not that far from the 20th century. And when people make huge universal pronouncements like that, I get a little bit skittish, right? We had a few of those in the 20th century. They didn't work out so well. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. I like, uh, I'm more comfortable when um, really smart, really powerful people and institutions make uh, realistic pronouncements about what they want to do in the world. Even if I disagree with the pronouncement, at least I know where they stand. This, this alarms me. It certainly makes me worry, right? It doesn't make me panic, but it makes me worry, right? Because what could come out of this is some lovely things, as certainly we've seen, right? Most of what Google does is, is lovely. Um, but then I read about an interview that Sergey Brin had done in which he was asked what would the perfect search engine be like, and he said it would be like the mind of God. This really made me worry. <laughs> and so I did a Google image search for the mind of God, um, and uh, I found some interesting things. And one of the things you'll see here is, of course, you don't see the Episcopal Church, right? You don't see Reform Judaism. You don't see the major mainstream religions presenting images and and using the, the text string, the mind of God. They don't have to, right? Because in the real world, that's where the conversation is. But in the web, you get a much more marginal set of conversations. And this, I think, points out the fact that um, while Google is indexing the web and presenting the web to us, let us not conflate the web with the world, right? The world's information and the web are not anything close to the same thing. And the value system of the world and the value system of the web, thank goodness, are not anything close to the same. And so I thought that was a really important insight and I wanted to build upon that. Of course, I started thinking about this almost theological vision of, 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 uh, of Google and I realized, well, hey, you know, Google's kind of omnipresent and omnipotent in terms of revenue and, and it's omniscient, of course, and, and it claims benevolence, right? And this, this, this was, again, making me worry, right? I, 
um, uh, being a pragmatist, I wanted companies to act like companies and not act like um, churches and, and company leaders not to act like theologians, knowing well, I mean, I have a PhD in American history. I know that, you know, every major corporate leader from Carnegie to Ford uh, had um, a theological bend to his vision of the world. So this is not unusual in American corporate history uh, to use theological language, um, but still, it made me worry. So these worries are piling up around 2004, 2005, when I decided I really had to write a book about Google. And what I wanted to talk about was our blind faith in Google. I wanted to talk about the fact that for many people, many of my dear friends, many of my colleagues, and many of the people I respect immensely, around 2004, 2005, there was a sense, and it's, it's been punctured in a healthy way, but there was a sense that if Google was gonna launch a big initiative, it would probably improve the world and the benefits would greatly outweigh the costs. And there was a lot of hyperbole in the air at the time, especially around the Google Books project. And this, again, put me ill at ease. So I wanted to know why we love Google. I wanted to understand the nature of that love, right? Um, which certainly struck me as more like agape than eros. But still, I wanted to, I wanted to get the sense uh, more than the sort of cheap and easy answer that we don't write a check to Google and we do write a check to Comcast, that you know, that's reason enough, but, uh, but there's more to it, right? Because there's such a deep trust. There's such a deep suspension of disbelief when you engage with Google. And for most people who don't necessarily know what a server is and don't necessarily know what an algorithm is or does, and we are talking about most people who use Google, this was my concern. What do they think is happening there? What do they think is the nature of the transaction? What do they think they're getting from Google? And what do they think they're giving to Google? Uh, and so I decided that knowing full well, here I was going to try to sell a book in a market, first the market of book proposals and then the market of pu public attention, that competing with Canaletta was folly, right? Competing with Jeff Jarvis is folly. They are going to get the, they get to ride on the plane. They, you know, they get to hang out with the big guys. They get to tell the inside story. They get to tell the biography. Or they get to tell the world, in Jarvis's case, that everyone should behave like the Google guys because then everyone will be as rich as Google somehow. Um, and, uh, and so I knew that that world was not for me. That story was not for me. I wanted to pay attention to us. I'm concerned and remain concerned about the ways we invite Google into our lives, how we use it, whether we use it well, um, what we learn from it, and what we fail to learn from it. Uh, and so that was uh, my motivation um, to write the People's Google book, <laughs> not knowing I would end up on AM morning talk radio um, to talk about this. Couldn't predict that, nonetheless. So here's a story to talk about, to sort of describe our poverty of, uh, uh, the poverty of our intellectual moment. Uh, summer of 2009, the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, Eric Schmidt is invited to give a presentation, as he often is at events like the Aspen Ideas Festival. <clears throat> and after his talk, Brian Lair, who's a, 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 an NPR, uh, uh, WNYC in New York, he's a radio host, NPR affiliate. Um, he stands up and he says, Eric, uh, have we reached the point where Google is so important for the world of information and so dominant in the market that we might need to consider regulating it like a public utility? And there's laughter. There's laughter. This is such an absurd question to ask in the United States of America in 2009. Uh, and that struck me first. Like, is it really an absurd question? No, I know, we all knew that people were laughing because they knew that Schmidt was probably making a funny face at that moment. I was listening to it on the radio, so uh, I couldn't really be sure. Um, but Schmidt's response was essentially, well, you won't be surprised to hear my answer is no. And his initial response was basically to say, look, we've already tried the command economy in the 20th century, and horrible things came from it. And so the last thing we want is for the state to tell businesses what to do in every case. And we really should trust in the free market and entrepreneurship, and that'll create a much more just world, as if those are the only two choices we have, right? And fortunately, Brian Lair, smart guy, saw right through that and said, wait a minute, that's an unfair answer. That doesn't address the question. We just had this big banking crisis. You know it's not an either or question of, you know, Stalin or, uh, you know, I don't know, 
<laughs> Ayn Rand, right? Those aren't the two choices, right? Those aren't the two choices we're living, for, we're living with here. And, uh, uh, and so he challenged him again. And so Schmidt responded. Um, he said, so, well, again, my answer would be no. We run Google based on a set of values and principles, and we work very hard to make sure people know what they are. And I'm actually convinced we don't actually understand all the values and principles. Um, and then he basically says, look, Google's drawn to be good, right? The opposite of Jessica Rabbit, right? I'm, Jessica Rabbit says, I'm, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way, right? Google is basically drawn to be good. It's designed to be good. And he says, regardless of who runs the company, Google will always be good. Therefore, hands off, don't mess with us, don't pay too much attention, because after all, you know us, right? You love us, and we're always good. This trick really worries me. And it's, it's, it's a trick, and it's actually been remarkably successful, and Google's not the only company that does this, right? But this really worried me, because this is essentially an argument against politics, and I'll, get to, I'll return to why that is true. Now, the fact is, when it comes to that question about regulation, that's a, the wrong question, because as we know, Google is regulated in so many different ways, right? Take one pervasive instrument of regulation, the copyright system, it's no accident that Google has dozens of lawyers devoted to copyright issues working there, right? Because it's a regulatory system, and Google has to manage through the regulatory system antitrust, they deal with patents, they deal with uh, uh, securities regulation every day, right? There's so many different regulatory systems that deal with Google and Google deals with. So let's not pretend for a second that any market and any market player anywhere in the world is free, right? The state touches everything, everything touches the state. That's, that's the world we live in. To start an argument pretending otherwise leads us down that absurd road where you can just make a joke about, oh, do you really want to live under Stalin, right? Uh, and in fact, that, that's one of the things that really bugs me, that talk about, especially talk about firms that deal with information technology, the conversation often ends at that laugh line and doesn't actually go any deeper. So we're not allowed to ask what would be best. We're not allowed to play around with different models and ideas. So I wanted to so walk, sort of walk through three big areas of Google's activities and show that they have different levels of activity, different levels of responsibility over the content they deliver, and therefore probably demand different models of regulation. And again, assuming that there is a level of regulation everywhere, some level. Now the first I want to introduce is rank and link. And this is what Google does mostly, and that's what we're most familiar with. It's what, it's what search is all about, right? It, it ranks stuff and it presents links. Now, in the rank and link model, Google doesn't pay for the content, doesn't create the content, doesn't invite the content. We do that, right? We're writing stuff, we're posting stuff, um, and it sits on third-party servers. Google's not responsible for those servers, doesn't have to keep them, doesn't have to keep the lights on, doesn't have to make sure that the content is legal, doesn't have to make sure the content is good or bad. But when it comes to how it presents it to us, then it starts asking some questions, right? And depending on the context, the legal context, the state in which Google's operating, you're going to get different levels of regulation. So you get a high level of regulation, obviously, in a place like the People's Republic of China, a moderate level of regulation in a place where, uh, for instance, nudity or pornography is highly restricted, a less uh, uh, intensive le level of regulation in a place like Western Europe where hate speech is illegal, and of course, a very low level of regulation here in the United States where copyright infringement um, and occasionally other sorts of abrogations might influence Google to take down a link or take down something from an index. Uh, but this is about the, le the lowest level of regulation that Google should expect because it is the lowest level res of responsibility, right? Google is not really responsible for the s crazy stuff that we put up on other servers, nor should it be. And of course, we all understand it should not be. It should ha be held to a pretty low level of liability for all the sorts of stuff that we do. The second model is what I call host and deliver. This is the YouTube model where Google servers stand there and, and Google invites us to upload content that we worked on or stole and, uh, and put on Google servers. And you would imagine that because these are Google servers, Google has a higher level of responsibility for what happens and what sits on those servers. And Google assumes this level of responsibility, which is why it spends a lot of money, hires a lot of people, and this has to be the worst job in the world to screen YouTube videos for icky stuff. And there are actually people at YouTube whose job it is to sit in a room 
and wait for the stuff that's been flagged by some computer that tries to measure flesh tones in videos. One of the weird things about YouTube is that people are still trying to upload porn to YouTube constantly. You know, like hours per day worth of porn is uploaded to YouTube. Of course, we never have to see it. We don't stumble upon it because Google does a really good job of filtering it out combination of using computers to filter it out and humans to filter it out, but what a horrible job. Not only that, they have to screen for pornography and they probably see the worst of the worst. And they have to screen for violence and they definitely see the worst of the worst there. Because there's a lot of violent stuff that ends up on YouTube, at least in the United States. Imagine the stuff that didn't get there, right? What a horrible job. But, so the, you know, but they do spend some money making sure that they keep YouTube uh, a fairly safe, pleasant, uh, experience, right? They, they assume some level of responsibility, but of course they're willing to deny responsibility by saying that if there is something offensive, it is up to us, the community, or members of the community, to tell Google to take something down, or ask Google to take something down. And there have been a number of instances of that, right? Which is why every video has a little link at the bottom inviting us to report um, unpleasant or unworthy material in case they missed it, or in case there's some other community standard they're not aware of. Uh, and the case of uh, um, the prosecution of three Google employees in Italy last year, I think, speaks to this, even though it's sort of an absurd prosecution. Um, one of the many absurd things about the government of Italy, and I don't even want to get started on that, but they, they decided to hold these uh, three Google officials criminally responsible for a YouTube video that had been up for a month before Italian authorities notified Google to take it down. Uh, and it was a video of a young man being bullied and beaten up, and it was a horrible video. And there were hundreds of comments opposing this video, complaining about this video beneath it. And so the Italian court basically said two things. One, Google's making money off of this, and so whatever sort of safe harbor provisions they think they're operating under. And uh, it turns out in EU law with privacy, the notion of safe harbor provisions is kind of murky and very outdated. It was all written in 1994, but that's trivia. The important thing was here that uh, uh, the Italian judge wanted Google held responsible because the comments should have constituted notification, right? And, and implied in that is that Google should be more vigilant up front about taking down potentially offensive things or things that would violate people's privacy. Um, and, and that, of course, is, from a US perspective, troublesome to, to, uh, to ask Google to be so um, active up front in filtering content is to put, put a tremendous burden on Google or any video hosting service uh, and, you know, for good reason, we worry whether those kinds of costs incurred would uh, make such a business less inviting for investment. Um, you can imagine if the Viacom copyright lawsuit had gone differently against Google, the same result, right? Viacom basically saying, no, no, we don't care what law we helped write in 1998 that says Google doesn't have to take anything down until we tell them about it. Uh, now we want the law tossed out and flipped around by the court because now Google has a responsibility to, um, uh, to uh, uh, upfront screen for copyright infringement so that they pay for the screening rather than the copyright holder. And of course, fortunately, um, uh, Google prevailed in that case. That's another case of this second model being controversial. The third model, I think, demands the highest level of scrutiny and the highest level of responsibility. And that is, capture and serve. In this case, Google actually goes out into the real world and creates digital content that it, hold, that it scans into its servers, holds on its servers, and serves up as part of search or maps in the case of Street View, right? So Google Street View, Google Earth, and the book search program are the three, I think, best examples of this model of content delivery. Um, Google's a publisher here completely, right? Google is completely responsible for what it captures and publishes. At every step, Google is making editorial decisions. Yet, Google wants a single standard, which is why, so for instance, if you have a problem with the fact that there's an untoward image of you on Street View somewhere, and you happen to know to look for yourself, right, which is part of the problem with the opt-out model, which is the single standard Google wants for everything. Google basically says, what's the problem? And in every lawsuit about Street View, Google has basically made this case. What's the problem? You can always just ask us to remove the image. Who knows how many times it's been circulated. Every week, someone sends me an email attachment of something ridiculous from Street View. Because I've given talks about Street View all over the world, and people say, oh, he would like this picture of someone urinating. You know, and I get all these weird, you know. So, and it's one of those things where you wonder, like, like, how vigilant do we have to be about ourselves that we're constantly looking on Street View to see if the Google cameras caught us doing something bad? And that's essentially what Google is asking us to do, 
right? Don't, you, you don't have no need to be embarrassed or, or, or incur harm for this because you can just ask us to remove it. After how long? I don't know, you know? But nonetheless, this is the standard Google wants, an opt-out standard, right? By default, everything gets to be in and presented for, by Google, and believe me, that's a good system for web search. I would assert it's not a good system for these other models in which Google is responsible at every level, um, in which it is not acting as a network or a conduit, but in fact is acting as a publisher. So here's one of the big lessons here, right? Google wants us to believe and often declares publicly that the nasty stuff that it presents to us through web search is a reflection of how ugly the web is and not the particular values and decisions baked into the algorithm. And this is really important. And so this is a famous uh, search, right? You're probably familiar with it. Search for the word Jew. This was done August, you can tell by the moon landing, uh, of, of 2009. Um, and I should, probably should repeat this search. For, you know, I give this presentation often enough. But you know, it, uh, it's probably not that different today. Um, and uh, the first entry is Wikipedia, which often happens on Google search results, especially about what it would call controversial or offensive results. Uh, and of course, Jewwatch News comes up essentially second. Jewwatch News is a uh, virulently anti-Semitic site. Um, it pops up often in any search about Jewish-related subjects or Judaism or the Holocaust. Uh, and it's because there's been a Google bombing campaign by anti-Semites to promote this one site. And of course, anti-Semites, like many other highly motivated groups, um, uh, has this organized campaign, right, to, to create links and, and, and nest all their pages to promote this one site. And of course, anti-Semites in particular tend not to have jobs or dates, so they have lots of time to do this sort of thing. Uh, and, and, and so what you end up with is, uh, uh, is that it's really hard to displace this finding. And uh, a number of years ago, I think it was around 2004, um, anti, the Anti-Defamation League had a meeting with, uh, with Mr. Brin and said, you know, we've got a problem here, right? We've been, we've been trying to promote um, other, they've been trying to do some Google bombing themselves and organize campaigns to, to, to move this down and move other things up and, uh, and it hasn't been working. You know, can Google help and what's the deal? Why are you presenting this horrible result for this word? You know, some eighth grader is not gonna know not to type in these three letters um, and is gonna, you know, is gonna come up with this, this really nasty result. Um, and, and Bryn basically said, look, it's not us, it's the computers, right? It's not us, it's the algorithm. This is how we do our job. You don't wanna have a situation where where um, we have human intervention uh, in, in the search results, that would, that would not be good. But uh, you know what we're gonna do, and this is the, what he did, he, he decided, first of all, as far as I know at the time, and I think still, he doesn't sell any ads, Google doesn't sell any ads on this search term. And, and that's a good thing, because who knows what kind of products would come up. Uh, but the offensive search results um, uh, link comes up at the top where um, a paid ad might be on many other searches. Uh, and if you click on that, it gives this same kind of explanation, it's not us. It's the computers. In fact, I quoted from it. Uh, and this one I did run this morning. Uh, and as you can see, basically it says that the beliefs and preferences of those who work at Google, as well as the opinions of the general public, do not determine or impact our search results. <sighs> this is where I move beyond worry, because that's a lie, right? That's an absolute lie. That happens all the time. Let me give you one recent example. About a year ago, people started discovering that if you do a Google image search for Michelle Obama, you, you get a horrible racist caricature as the top result. Again, Google bombing by racists. Uh, this was alarming and disgusting to everyone involved. And so, without telling anyone, Google removed the image from its index. So it no longer showed up for about two weeks until a number of people started raising the question of, hey, what about the the Jew Watch News problem. Like, you know, why did you do it for this image of Michelle Obama and not for, for the Jew Watch News problem? And they didn't have a good answer, because there isn't a good answer. And believe me, I'm sympathetic to the fact that there is no good answer. And I'm not, I'm not gonna argue that they should scrub Jew Watch News from the index or, or manipulate it to decrease it. I just wanna point out that it is wrong to say that they never do this, because they do do this. Now they ended up having to backtrack and replace this image in the index, and last time I checked, it was still the number one result for Michelle Obama in Google image search, and you can probably check yourself. Now it may still be. Um, obviously, I'm not willing to put it into a presentation. Um, and it's, uh, this is, I mean, again, it's not like, put me in charge of Google, I'm gonna make the right decision here. 
because there is no good choice. But at least, at least I would like the company to be honest about the fact that there is no good choice. Now it turns out, right now we're in the middle of a, a pretty hot search engine optimization arms race. There have been a number of accounts recently, overstock.com, JCPenney, they've been discovered abrogating the terms of service, basically just angering Google by doing some black hat SEO tactics to try to pump up their results. The most fascinating was overstock.com, where they were paying uh, people with .edu domains to create links to overstock.com products because Google, in its wisdom, has tended to favor links coming from .edu over .com because they're more likely to be reliable, right? Because, <laughs> hey, we're reliable, right? <laughs> we'll tell you what clothes to buy. Maybe we shouldn't, we shouldn't be telling people what clothes to buy, but still. Um, you know, but that's, that's an, and it's not an unreasonable value judgment to make when making an algorithm, right? And we're always making value judgments when making algorithms. Um, so of course, Overstock.com figured this out and started pumping up its results by getting all these .edu links. Um, Google found it, decided to punish, right? Uh, uh, decided like in an Old Testament way to punish Overstock.com as it had punished JCPenney some time before. Uh, and so Google's doing this massive revision. And today on Google's blog, um, uh, it, it announced a major change. It says we'll uh, alter about 12% of the queries. Uh, and this is what the blog says. This update is designed to reduce rankings for low quality sites, sites which are low value add for users. Their grammar, not mine. Uh, copy content from other websites or just that are, I'm sorry, or, or that are just not very useful. At the same time, it will provide better rankings for high quality sites, sites with original content and information such as research, in-depth reports, and thoughtful analysis, and so on. What I wonder is how this is gonna affect Huffington Post, right? Because this kind of describes all the crap on Huffington Post, right? And Huffington Post is the reason that it was valuable enough for AOL to get into another ridiculous deal is that it's mastered SEO. Right, and, the, and one of the reasons, that, one of the, the implications of it mastering search engine optimization is that uh, local newspapers are screaming at them because if you, so I'll give you an example. There was, um, at my university, there was a horrible uh, uh, murder of one student of another last spring. Uh, and uh, when I was following people uh, tweeting about it, I noticed that almost all the links to this story were Huffington Post repurposing of my local newspaper, in which people were getting just enough information, because all you need for most daily updates is, is the lead paragraph, just enough information about it from Huffington Post, therefore pumping up Huffington Post's ad position and not going to the Charlottesville Daily Progress. Right? That's the sort of practice that Huffington Post goes through. But because Huffington Post is what you find in any Google search of any current news event, almost always, um, you tend not to end up on the landing page of the original content provider. It's a huge challenge within journalism. It's not really my thing. I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't have a dog in that fight. It's whatever, but that is what's going on here. This is probably not about Huffington. This is actually much more about the content farm uh, production that's going on uh, that's also corrupting Google News and, to some degree, the larger search engines. Uh, and it probably has something to do with the overstock.com move as well. But tell me that's not human beings making value judgments about what goes into search, right? Tell me that this statement doesn't directly contradict this statement, right? The, the difference is, of course, it's not like they're putting a particular editorial decision, this page yes, this page no, into the algorithm. They always do it at one degree, right? They just alter, the, alter what counts in general, knowing that the results will be the same. Google's changing in a lot of ways, not just that they're in this SEO arms race, which, by the way, is creating a lot of chaos in the search results, right? One of the, one of the crazy things, and I, I surveyed as much social science as I could about search engines. One of the crazy things about trying to study search engines from an academic perspective um, is that you can't repeat experiments. <laughs> you know, like you do the, run the same search, an hour later, you're likely to get different results. You run the same search, Two counties over, you get different results. You run the same search from a different browser in the same computer, you get different results, right? I mean, there's, the way, there's just no way to control for all the variables. So there's no way to say, Google does the following in any, in any consistent way. And the people who have done the interesting studies of search result results all 
all did publish their work around 2002, three, and four uh, before Google's algorithms were um, as as quickly updated as they are now. Right? It was it was much more stable back then. But what's going on here now? and Google's very explicit about this, is that search results are increasingly personalized, increasingly localized, right? Um, that it's all about user satisfaction, and Google has always been about speed. Uh, its user studies in the early days showed that its big advantage was speed, especially in the dial-up world. That's why Google has the blank page. It's not just an aesthetic choice. It was a soothing result, right? The first time you found Google, and I did, on my blog, I asked people, tell me about your first time. And that's, all, that's what they said. Like, you know, the web was crazy. There were gophers screaming at me and things doing all kinds of stupid stuff and, and, and bright lights. And all of a sudden, I found Google so cool and calm. You know? But it actually, it loaded faster. That was one of the big decisions they made and one of the course choices. And the fact that they, at the very moment that there was a whole lot of surplus bandwidth and surplus server space available, you know, around 2000 when a lot of companies went out of business, Google scooped it all up to make sure that their system was really fast. They had the best processing power, the best bandwidth. So Google returns results in split seconds, and you know you might not think that matters because we like to think we're above that, but no, like a, a tenth of a second matters to our satisfaction. And Google has consistent results showing that. So it's all about speed. It's all about pushing more and more information out there. It's all about favoring the new. These are some of the changes also. Temporality matters, right? Especially in the age of Twitter, right? Temporality matters in search results, which means search results are increasingly biased toward the new. And that can be good if you're trying to keep up with what's going on in North Africa, but it's not necessarily good if you're trying to figure out how a big idea moved over time, even the last 10 years, right? It's not necessarily the best situation. But in trying to keep everything fresh, this is the, these are the value choices Google is making, which makes it better for shopping, right? Google is getting better for shopping every day. Not surprising that this is their goal. After all, if you look at the way that Bing is advertised, it's all about shopping. Nobody ever said, there's no commercial that says, go to Bing to figure out climate change, right? No, there's no commercial that says, you want to have questions about climate change, use Bing, right? No, it's you want to book an airline ticket, you want to shop for shoes, Bing's the decision engine. It's all about shopping, right? And frankly, most of what we do online is shopping, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all in favor of shopping. But let's sever these two value systems from our point of view. And I think this is really important. Google is getting better and better for shopping every day. Therefore, it's getting worse and worse for learning every day. Now, we had, have had a really good ride for 12 years in which one search engine has actually done a really good job helping us shop and helping us learn. I'm convinced that that's not going to be the case very much longer. And we are going to have to start pushing at this system, experimenting in new ways, trying to figure out new and better ways to enhance learning in this environment, or it's going to all be about shopping. Now, that Eric Schmidt qu quote, that was a direct appeal to the ethic of corporate social responsibility. And this is what makes me worry most. And I'm giving you a little hint. This is probably going to be my next book, if not book, article. Well, the Hippopotamus book is next. After the Hippopotamus book, I'll probably have to write about corporate social responsibility because it fascinates me. I wonder, I'm not convinced, but I have a hunch the corporate responsibility has gotten us into all kinds of trouble. It's been a growing and pervasive ideology in the private sector since the late 1960s. Uh, and I'm convinced that it is depoliticizing us. Maybe I'm not convinced, but this is what I want to test, that it's depoliticizing us. It's, it's using our sense of consumer satisfaction to alleviate guilt just enough that we don't make the next step to political activism. This deeply worries me. I'm not sure I'm right. I have to confess, I drive my Prius to Whole Foods every couple days, right? I'm as guilty as anybody of falling for corporate responsibility claims. But one of the things I learned from Google, which is the most sincere example of corporate responsibility I can find. I mean, they really buy this stuff, right? They, they, uh, they have arguments of ethical nature at the highest levels every day and at every point in the company, as far as I can tell. They're not lying to us about this. They may be lying to themselves. That's what I'm afraid of. And ultimately, what I'm afraid of is that Eric Schmidt argument. Don't pay attention to us. Don't ask hard questions of us. Don't invite state regulation where it might actually create an optimal situation because trust us, we're good. Isn't it better to make it a matter of consumer choice? After all, if we were bad, you would just go to Bing. 
If we were bad, you would just go to Yahoo. If you were bad, you would just go to Yandex or one of the other Russian search engines. It actually does better than Google in Russia. So, so this is something that makes me worry quite a bit because I think we may have caused ourselves more trouble than we wanted. And there's a reason that corporate social responsibility is so dominant and so important uh, in our current socio-political and economic situation. And that is that it's an essential element of both libertarianism and neoliberalism. It is a big element. You may remember about it a year and a half ago um, uh, when John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal against the health care plan. And his argument, if I may sum it up, was something like, we don't need any sort of big national program for health care because look at my company, I make sure my employees have great health care. And every company should be as good as my company, A. And B, he ended it with something like, and by the way, if you just ate a lot of kale, you would never get cancer, and so why do we have to worry? <laughs> and I've tried kale. I've driven my Prius to Whole Foods to buy kale, and I'm not going back for kale. But <laughs> that's, that's a whole other talk. I've got a whole kale talk. I can, um, but basically, something interesting happened in 1970. Because this gentleman, Milton Friedman, wrote an op-ed, or a short article in the New York Times Magazine, in which he said this. This was the title, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. And he was making a macroeconomic and microeconomic case that this is what firms should do. They're actually legal, legally obligated to, to enhance value for their shareholders. And all this nonsense that was growing through the 1960s, that corporations should res be respectful of their various stakeholders. Uh, he basically said, this, this is just ridiculous. You know, we should just push on to make money. Now, you would think that libertarians would embrace much of what Friedman, and of course they did embrace much of what Friedman had to say, but Friedman was actually not a libertarian. Um, uh, and the recoil intellectually in libertarian com uh, uh, communities was actually quite interesting. But there's, there's, a, uh, there's a, uh, an interesting thing that grows out of this, and that is that Within libertarian cir circles, it became really clear that if corporations don't offer consumers and investors choices that are socially responsible, that, that can mitigate negative externalities like pollution and discrimination, if that doesn't happen, we still have the problems in the world, and we're going to have to invite the state in to solve them. Right? We're going to have to invite the state in to solve market failures. We're going to have to invite the state in to mitigate negative externalities like cancer. And we don't want that, right? So how do, we, how do we counter the argument that the market doesn't satisfy everything we need and that the market can actually create harms without the state? Well, let's make it, let's, let's build that into market choice. And this trick has worked to the point where people who are not libertarians, who are basically just neoliberals, have endorsed it as well, uh, which is how we get into our current situation. So this is one of the reasons I'm deeply afraid that it has depoliticized us. So, there's this concept that I identified in this book, that I'll expand on in the next book after the hippopotamus book, uh, called public failure. It's the opposite of market failure. Market failure, we know, is when the market can't satisfy a, a need, right? And uh, uh, especially a, a common good, can't, uh, a public good, can't satisfy a public good. And so we, you know, the market won't support opera, so we have government institutions that subsidize opera. Okay, that's well understood. Apparently now it's not that popular an argument, but that was the argument. Market failure, I'm sorry, public failure is when we design or, or, or um, inhibit the state to such a degree that it cannot do its job. It cannot do what we charge it to do. We design it to fail. Think about the prison system. We designed it to fail so we could outsource it to private companies who have then, of course, been more expensive and more brutal than the, the other system that failed, right? We designed the public schools to fail, so now we outsource billions of dollars to companies that are cleaning up and doing education more expensively and still failing, right? This is public failure, and here is, I think, the, the starkest example of public failure. After Hurricane Katrina, the state and federal disaster authorities had been defunded and declawed to such a degree they couldn't deliver water to thousands of people, so Walmart did. Walmart stepped into the vacuum of public failure. An interesting thing happens in the wake of Katrina. Uh, if you follow um, uh, libertarian 
arguments coming out of some quarters like George Mason University, you see this example being put forth for an argument that maybe the state shouldn't be in the disaster relief business at all. Because after all, how could the state possibly create a system that works as well as Walmart? Shouldn't we just rely on the fact that Walmart will always want to drive its trucks down from Arkansas to save thousands of people because it makes Walmart look good? Not that people have a choice. They still have to shop only at Walmart in most of Arkansas and Louisiana anyway. But thank goodness for Walmart, all right? Don't get me wrong. I'm really glad Walmart saved thousands of lives. I'm glad someone did. But isn't it a shame that we had to get to that point, right? And now the argument is flipped on its head. It's not that, at least in some circles, it's not that, hey, maybe we should have actually had a disaster relief system that could have saved thousands of people up front and been a public effort that we could all have a stake in. Instead, it becomes, hey, we don't have to worry. Walmart will take care of us. So this, I think, is a really major worry. Ultimately, this is what I want to leave you with. The chaos of the web, the chaos of the web demanded governance. At the very moment when we were being told, or at least we had in our minds, that the web was either ungovernable or best left ungoverned, we knew better. We knew that the web in 1999 and 2000 was ugly and messy and, and unwieldy and impossible to use effectively. And so Caesar came. We essentially accepted the role of Caesar. Right? Caesar stepped into a vacuum, into, uh, into a vacuum of chaos, a power vacuum, and said, I will rule benevolently. And that's essentially most of the citizens of Rome were, of Rome were actually pretty happy with how Google ruled. Um, Google ruled. Caesar ruled. Uh, oh, little slip, right? So, um, so what we have in this situation is a benevolent ruler who is uh, running the web very well, uh, reflecting values that many, if not most of us, share, at least from a United States perspective, uh, and doing so in a way that doesn't demand us to pay it. Right? We don't have to pay a tax directly to Google. I mean, this is a really neat situation. But let's at least get a full understanding of it. Right? It's not a situation I necessarily want to change. I do not want to stab Caesar. I do not want to call for a coup d'etat. I don't even want to boycott Google. I think we should embrace Google and use it as much as possible, but use it intelligently, wisely, and we should push back at it publicly when we can and when we see a problem. And I don't think we have had a mature enough level of discussion about uh, this major player in our information ecosystem, which is why I think everyone should buy and read my book. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, let's talk. Hi. So uh, Google and most other search engines do that as well as um, collecting what is close to a personal dossier on users. And it's also important to remember that there are two levels of Google users. There's the, uh, the, the usual Google user, which I think is probably the vast majority of Google users, those who do not sign in and register with the Google service. And therefore, Google knows only what its cookies can follow uh, on a particular browser, and it might not be one person, but it's at least one browser. And Google knows, of course, the IP number, so it does know the zip code, essentially, right? It knows where the computer sits. And the search results are tailored for that. And that's pretty specific in, in and of itself. You get a, a pretty good level of targeting. Uh, if your IP number comes from a university, they're going to relate those search results to what other people at that university set of IP numbers have expressed in the past. And, and that's not a bad way to guess in terms of both search results and advertisements. Um, the Google Prime users, right, the super users, th those of us who have a Gmail account or upload things to YouTube and are registered with Google and tend not to log out um, uh, because we're too lazy, uh, they, Google has a much richer body of information about what we do and what we care about and what we dream about and what we fantasize about and all sorts of other things. So um, uh, Google then uh, essentially uh, tailors results in that sense. So Google's doing both uh, of what you said. Now, you could say perhaps we need a regulation that keeps Google's profiling at the IP number level. And I think that's not a bad conversation starter. And that may actually be a worthwhile policy. Um, that sort of intervention, though, um, as a blanket top-down uh, intervention, would so threaten this new area of the advertising industry that you end up with um, all sorts of complaints from, for instance, major American newspapers that are trying to make money through the same kind of advertising. Yeah. 
advertising.com. Mm. Um, I'm now an investor and director in Tagman and just a whole raft of interactive advertising uh, companies. And actually, I'm not sure I would agree with that. Okay. I, I think actually they are, A, they're concerned, and B, what they want to do is deliver a value. And the advertiser doesn't really want to know whether you're uh, a 34 or a 35. Or th he just wants to know are you small, medium, or large. And so actually everybody is disserviced by this. Even the doctor doesn't need to know. Even the medic doesn't need to know your name. Actually, 10% sure. ten percent doesn't need to know your name. Might want to know your age. Might want to know your gender. Might want to know whether you listen to Arcade Fire, whether you watch Saturday Night Live. Those are the sorts of things that, well, and that's why Facebook is a valuable um, uh, template for advertising targeting as well. So yes, name doesn't matter to anybody. And they don't care about having a dossier in a formal way about you. But they do want to know you as a member of a series of niche communities, and then they can effectively associate. Um, and it's a really you know, sort of powerful idea within advertising. And right now, it's the only way anyone's making money in advertising. So it's a, uh, I'm just saying, I, I don't want to knock down your idea. I actually think your idea is, is, uh, is really fruitful. Um, but that is the, the political um, barrier to it. So. Uh, yeah, this gentleman here. Is not evil. Oh, sorry. One of the real problems with the you know, Google is not evil, you know, statement is that, you know, regardless of what the good intentions are of the people who are currently owning and operating Google, it's a publicly traded company. At some point, it could fall into the hands of people who are perceived as being more evil, like you know, Bennett LeBeau, uh, Rupert Murdoch, uh, whoever you know, pick your favorite corporate villain. Uh, there's no, there's no inherent corporate DNA that keeps. The, char the character of the company the way it is through the retirement and death of its founders, for instance, which, you know, even if it isn't publicly taken over, that, could, that, that, that will occur. Or worse, um, poverty. Uh, poverty may be worse than death for a corporation. So imagine uh, that over the next 10 years, the predictions that Jonathan Zittron made in his book come true, and the, the open web matters less and less to us. The open internet matters less and less to us. The um, the proprietary lockdown device matters more and more. At that point, Apple or some other company like Apple has the ability to um, siphon away a significant amount of ad revenue. And imagine that the, um, the gated community of Facebook does the same. Uh, and Google ends up not being as wealthy as it is, right? It's easy to be good when you're rich. That's not a problem, right? If it's a choice, uh, if, if you have almost no money, it's really hard to be good. Um, uh, and that may be a situation, I think a more likely situation than a massive turnover is a sense that 10 years from now, we have no idea what Google's financial situation will be. We have no idea whether it's going to cut and run on the books program. I mean, that was one of my fundamental things. Like, why are we trusting and depending on this one company that at that time had been around for six years when it announced the book search program, and at that time had actually been a company for less time than Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston had been married? Um, and, and look how well that went, right? So uh, in other words, like companies are ephemeral, and by their natures are ephemeral, and their existence is ephemeral, and their profits are ephemeral. And, uh, and you know, here you had the 150-year-old University of Michigan, right, and the 300-year-old Harvard University saying, oh, please, six-year-old company, please run, uh, please be the custodian of our, of our heritage and our great knowledge, um, and we'll give you access to many millions of dollars of material, and we expect essentially no, no payment in return. Um, and that, to me, was just absurd. I mean, that seemed reckless. Because we don't know what the company's going to be like in 10 years. And that's, I think, an important thing. Just because Google's been really good to us and for us for the last 12 doesn't mean it will be for the next 12. In fact, I, I would bet that it will be very different. Yes? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the factors that will is also pushing it to be different, besides the Bing shopping model, is, of course, the Facebookization of everything. And so last year, you know, time spent on Facebook surpasses Google. and. Additionally, I think it's interesting to kind of look outside of the, the U.S. context and look internationally. I mean, Facebook has developed uh, uh, agreements with mobile operators in more than 20 countries to actually provide free internet access via mobile devices for folks who've never had data plans on, on mobile devices before, but it's through, fa through the Facebook Zero program, which basically means Facebook will be the web for the next billion of people coming online. Um, so, but, but what I wanted to actually ask was about Again, sort of looking at international context, what, what happens when you start to look at, um, well, one, other dominant search engines in other spaces, but also some of the alternative projects, which are, would, uh, are, are marginal now. And I'm thinking of you know, archive.org or the conversations that seem to be endless conversations about the, the digital uh, public library that 
we're, there's starting to be a new initiative here, you know, yeah, yeah. that Berkman's involved in. So what, what do you see as, I guess, uh, on the one hand, in, ter in international context, on the other hand, in terms of possible alternative projects and how they could scale? Okay, so that's great, because this is actually the conclusion of my book. Um, so two things. One, I had, three, four years ago, great hopes for the Android initiative and a couple of re for a couple of reasons. When Android was first proposed, right, and this notion that Google would be providing uh, a mobile phone operating system, I had assumed, and I took seriously the policy positions of Google at the time, that this would help wrench open um, our, our domestic mobile phone markets and you know, radically alter the position of the FCC on a lot of important questions. And eventually, Google would march to protect network neutrality on uh, the mobile space. None of that happened. Right, it's now actually, oh, but here's my great hope, my big hope about Android, and I don't think anyone at Google actually said this explicitly, but I, I truly wanted the goal of Android ultimately to be a cheap phone. Um, a, a cheap phone that uh, people in countries without steady electricity could use. A cheap phone that could be used on fairly um, uh, uh, low power digital networks rather than uh, the 3G, 4G, et cetera, networks that we have here and in Korea and, uh, and in Europe. I wanted, uh, and I really, and I still remain hopeful that um, Google recognizes that uh, that is where the growth in the mobile phone industry will be um, over the next 10 years. And that wouldn't it be better to create the first smartphone interface that can work on anybody's Nokia, uh, uh, you know, that five-year-old Nokia? Um, rather than uh, have it come on these three, four, and five hundred dollar devices. Um, I dropped mine in a puddle earlier today, so <laughs> my mind's on the expensive mobile phone right now. It actually works right now. So, but, but you know, but so like it's been very disappointing to see um, Google go for the expensive uh, phone. And I understand that you do that to establish a name, to establish a lot of good reviews about it and journalism about it, and and it is a lucrative market if you can you know, license uh, your app store out that way too. Um, and it's a good way to, to become important. And, and Android is now the fastest growing, um, <laughs> the fastest growing uh, uh, mobile phone platform in the world. Uh, yet, we haven't seen it ad ad adapted for, um, for these areas of the world where, um, if you can imagine, connectivity is worse than it is on AT&T, uh, if that's possible. So. Um, uh, so that, I mean, th that never happened. It may happen, but it may not happen. And, uh, uh, and I, I was really hopeful that that would be part of the transformative effort of, of Android. Instead, it turns to me, it seems to me like Google's panicking to some degree, panicking about Facebook, panicking about Apple, and deciding that it really needs to muscle in on that space at the high end of the market and resign on network neutrality for the mobile space because after all, that's where their partners is. It's not, uh, and we shouldn't forget when flashing on the don't be evil sign and remembering its big conflict with China a year ago, that all those phones are built in China. And so there's no way that Google pulled out of China. And I hate when people say that Google pulled out of China. It did not. Google closed down one search engine that was based in the People's Republic of China so that it didn't do the active censoring. Now it just does passive censoring, right? The search results are still censored just like they were before. It's just the government does it instead of Google does it. And things are no better for people in China. Things are no freer in China. And yet Google retains thousands of employees doing research, thousands of employees working on mobile phone projects, and lots of contracts with companies that, frankly, aren't necessarily good for workers. Um, there's, there have been a lot of nasty things going on in those factories that make our phones that I dropped in a puddle today. And, uh, and you know, that should be part of how we challenge any company that makes an assertion about corporate social responsibility. Um, and so, I mean, one of the things that happened last year with their, their uh, showdown with China is I just saw it from the beginning as, as, as deeply ridiculous. And the fact that they, they managed to earn cred from uh, human rights organizations I thought was shoddy. Like, I thought that there wasn't a real examination of what was going on because Google did nothing to make life better in China. Absolutely nothing. And Google did not pull out of China by any means. Um, all they did was a surface level move. Um, and I frankly think that because I think companies should do what's good for themselves, that Google should have just said, hey, this is the law in China and it's horrible and we don't like it. But what we really don't like is the abrogation of our security, which was the real issue. And what, I really, what really bugs me about what happened in China a year ago is that the story should have been that Gmail is insecure. And the story should have been that 30 US companies had had its security uh, violated 
by the same breach. The same people were, were, were breaching the security of 30 US companies, some of them defense contractors. That's the story. The story is all these stupid companies have really bad security and we're in danger, right? But that didn't become the story. It became, hey, look how brave Google is for standing up for, uh, against censorship and for human rights in China, when in fact nothing changed to make China better. And as far as I can tell, nobody in the government of the People's Republic of China has been adequately chastened for this, despite the fact the Secretary of State called them out by name over this issue in a speech about internet freedom when this was not about internet freedom, this was about security. Uh, and so that whole event, I think, um, should have uh, raised our concerns in a completely different direction. Instead, nobody thinks of Gmail as basically insecure. And people active in, uh, in dissident organizations around the world still rely on, on, on Gmail and other s Google products for, uh, to, to do their business. And it's probably not always a good move, but you know, we've, lost that, we've lost that message. I'd like to give you a reference for your corporate social responsibility yes. and then ask a question. Um, Gil Friend wrote a book called The Truth About Green Business. Gil has been doing um, environmental business consulting for many, many years. Oh, good. And the book is interesting, and I'm sure that he's thought about corporate responsibility, especially as relates to the green movement in very deep ways. I, I'll talk to you afterwards, and I'll write it down. Thank okay. you. Um, it seems to me that I've been smelling something beginning uh, around and about. When Egypt turned off the internet, people started talking about mesh networks and how do you get around all this stuff and maybe there's some way that we should do a people's internet. Douglas Rushkoff has called for a conference in September to talk about that, forming a people's internet. There's a group that's, that's buying, trying to buy a satellite to provide low cost access to the poorest people in the world. And it seems to me that, that you're building some of the foundations around the search part. And so I want to ask you, am I smelling something yeah. that there might be a fire? And is this at all possible? OK, is it possible? I don't know. Is it worth pursuing? Definitely. <clears throat> and I'm, I, I'm firm in the belief that um, Things are as viable as they are desirable, right? So um, I don't know that Doug Rushkoff's meeting is going to produce a takeaway that is someone can run with in the next five years. But thank goodness he's doing it. Thank goodness we're at least exploring the possibility. Because now, surprise, surprise, like 20 years after Al Gore stood up there and talked about the information superhighway, we're realizing that the privatization of every step in our information ecosystem has some costs as well as benefits, right? And that they may not satisfy all our needs. It really didn't surprise a lot of people in this room, but we're all sort of realizing that now, especially in the wake of the, um, uh, the, the pressures on WikiLeaks and so forth that, that had gone forth. That you know, all of a sudden people were saying, "Can you imagine corporations are being careful and and chicken?" You know, <laughs> well, of course they are. They're corporations, right? Why does why does this surprise you? And when you rely on these corporations, this is what you're going to get, right? Um, uh, and so there may, in fact, we may, in fact, need some other models for how to pursue this. Now, I didn't actually get to what the conclusion of my book is. The conclusion of my book is something called the Human Knowledge Project, in which I say what we need to do is stop focusing on the next six months and start focusing on the next 50 years and say we want to, we may want to, and I actually want to, create an information ecosystem that levels out the discrepancies and access to information around the world. That is what I would love to see in the next 50 years. That's what I would love to leave my child. And not my child. Actually, my child's fine, right? My child can actually get into university databases if she wanted to and look up hippopotami. But what I care about is a child in South Africa, right, or a child in Sudan who doesn't have access to all these amazing things. And so often we focus on, when we think about information policy, when we think about information initiatives, we focus on my daughter. We say, what would be good for my daughter's classroom? What would be good for my daughter's um, mobile access? Or what would be good for me? Like, we're not hurting, right? I got more access to information than I ever need, and I ever knew, will need, right? But we should be trying to focus on those who need it most, those who can use it most, those who can make the most use of information on smallpox or malaria, right? Information on effective water use in farming. That's the sort of dream we should have about information connectivity. It shouldn't be about the $500 phone. 
right? And it shouldn't necessarily be about what's good for my students or my daughter. That, that as my starting point, I say we should actually convene a 50-year planning conversation, or a conversation that plans the next 50 years, that says, okay, if we're gonna get to the point where no kid in Sudan has less access to information than a kid growing up in Sweden, if we're gonna get to that point, what will it take to get to that point? Some of the barriers are political, obviously. Some parts of the world will not sign on to the system, and that's okay. We have certain technological barriers, but those are actually the least of our problems. We, we have tremendous ability to actually make this happen. And we have legal and policy challenges, copyright first and foremost among them, right? that we would actually have to address through legislatures, which actually is how it's supposed to happen. Um, and uh, we have a coordination problem across states and across NGOs and so forth. And so I would want to bring in representatives of states, of NGOs, of private companies, of libraries around the world, and say, how do we create a global digital library that could serve this need over 50 years? What are the barriers? Let's list them. Let's come up with strategies to approach those barriers. And we might even agree at this meeting that it's not worth doing. But let's at least agree it's not worth doing, rather than say, hey, look, big rich company's going to do it for us. Because we get nothing good out of that in the long run. We get, again, satiated, right? We think, oh, cotton candy is food. And that's not really the lesson that we should be learning or passing on to anybody. Guy, yeah. It's kind of this weird irony, right? It's all about information, but it strikes me as a very opaque organization. So I was yeah. wondering if you, like, if you had access to anybody people in Google, if you were to, able to do interviews and things like that? I had polite access, right? I sat down with a number of important people at Google, and they gave me their line on how they do what they do. And that was very helpful and very kind. But I wasn't writing that kind of book. You know, I wasn't trying to get inside what Google does. The research I was doing, basically, I interpret and, um, and repurpose uh, real work that real social scientists do, right? I don't actually know how to do real social science work. I was never trained to do it. I have a PhD in American Studies, which is the undisciplined. Um, and so, uh, if anything, I'm trained as a historian, so I'm essentially doing history of the last 12 years and the next six months, right? Or the next 50 years, right? So, uh, so my techniques and my sort of, um, uh, uh, my ethic and my approach and my uh, theoretical frameworks come from, from history, um, but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking at um, scholars like Judith Barilan, uh, uh, who's a scholar in Israel, who's done a lot of the early work on search engine usage uh, and uh, a lot of user studies. Uh, I'm, I'm using uh, a lot of work uh, on privacy done by legal scholars um, uh, or people like Michael Zimmer at University of uh, Milwaukee, or University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, um, and, and, and sort of building on their findings uh, and working them into my argument. Uh, you know, so my job is in many ways to be the translator of this much more important and brilliant work being done by um, people who are working harder than I am and, uh, and, uh, and actually deserve to be known better. Um, so that's not really my purpose. My purpose is to free ride on their uh, labor, but, you know, if I can help them out, whatever. Um, uh, but ultimately, uh, I'm trying to bring a new framework for our interaction to Google, if I can do that. So that's my goal, and thus... I dodged your question about my research methods because I've been dodging that question since my first job interview. <laughs> so um, I think we have to wrap up, right? Yeah. Oh, one more, okay, yeah. Obviously Android is a open source solution. I think a lot of people, well, <laughs> compared to like, let's yeah, talk yeah. about Steve Jobs. It's and opener. Yeah, <laughs> um, but ultimately it's, it's up to the carriers to implement, mm -hmm. you know, full blown, Android or hobbled or you've got to buy your apps through our store either you know domestically or abroad so there's a little confusion I think in the consumer's mind that this is ultimately the the challenge with giving it away is up to the carriers to implement yeah, yeah. the the thing so as far as um, obviously I'm sure like Metro PCS now has like a Google phone prepaid which obviously starts to hit the market that like you were just discussing um, and so the price point will come down on those phones but ultimately it doesn't come down to African level. true um, and I'm, I agree I think Google realizes that you know that's really that's where the future is you know in the next 50 to 100 years because they're getting away from the investment in infrastructure you know infrastructure that we've gone through from the industrialized age and they're just going wireless they're just going so um, the question is obviously getting back to um, the Google Books project which seems like it's near and dear to your heart, and I'm not in library science, but um, I knew the team over at, at 
here in Cambridge who did the Ingram viewer and, and began sort of playing around with that and some fascinating insights about sort of culture over the last couple hundred years, key to sort of specific terms and words. Um, so if, uh, for whatever reasons uh, you've addressed today, you know, concerns and hesitations about the Google Books project, like what is a, what it, what is a viable alternative? Because mm -hmm. uh, sort of similar to Walmart, you know, with Katrina, you know, that they had them and actually Home Depot both had the best infrastructure far and away than the US government or FEMA could actually get product to people who were in, who were in desperate straits. Um, you know, Google has, you know, this vast stash of cash. They have the infrastructure. They're able to go out and say to these libraries. I would add we'll for take now and for now to both those things. True. I, I agree. Um, and meanwhile, you know, there's been some talks about how do we do this or, or how do we implement it, but Google's actually out there doing it, right? Yeah, I, I actually don't think they're doing it. Oh. Uh, I think that they are talking about doing it. If by it we mean a, an actual global library project, they're not doing it. Um, they're making a big bookstore, the biggest used bookstore in the world, which is nice in itself. I love used bookstores. I love shopping. I've bought stuff from the Google bookstore. But that's what they're doing. And they're not doing a library, and they're not doing it based on the principles of the librarianship, and they're not doing it by, with the ethics of librarianships. To, to use one example, they don't respect user confidentiality the way librarians would. Um, and the libraries, to my great frustration, have not recognized that there is a fundamental difference and distinction between these two models of how to build something to the point where in my own university library, which is a Google partner, I'm invited from the university library catalog to click on view this through Google Books and then flip to the Google site. And at no point am I warned that I'm now exiting a system that does not track my usage and entering a system that does. And that, I think, is deeply irresponsible. So that's my problem with the libraries. So Google's making a bookstore. It's not making a library. Even though Sergey Brin wrote an op-ed in the New York Times October of last year saying, we're building a huge library so in case Stanford burns to the ground, we'll still have all their books. That's not what they're doing. If they were doing that, if they were actually interested in preservation, and anyone who actually works on the project at Google never uses preservation talk, right? But Brin hasn't been keyed in on this, right? They're actually dealing with preservation. They would deal with high-quality scans. Instead, they're low-quality scans. They're really low-quality scans, sometimes with human hands in the front, right? They would deal with uh, something like decent metadata, and their metadata is a disaster. Uh, and they would have a search system that actually made sense. And their search system is ridiculous. Um, there's no reason for one book to be ranked above another in Google Book Search. No reason, because there aren't hyperlinks up between and among these books. And the only thing that they've talked about in recent months is books that are linked to from other web pages get priority. That, again, biases the new. It biases the techie, because who makes web links, right? My mom doesn't make web links, but I make web links, because I live in the techie world, right? So people in the techie world, and you can see the biases that emerge from that, are going to have their books favored in Google Book Search. That's all we know about Google Book Search search, right? So a librarian would do design a search system with a very different set of priorities in there. A librarian would focus on the quality of images, if it, especially if it were about preservation. A librarian would key it up with a, a, a print-on-demand service over time, so it would actually be well integrated with print-on-demand, so there would be redundancy in the situation, knowing that all of these files may be unreadable in 50 years, but at least we'll have the paper. Uh, and a librarian would, would have built in good metadata from day one, instead of scrambling for it later. Um, and so I don't think that what Google does has done is anything close to what it claimed it would do, or what people thought it would do, or what the hyperbole was about. Um, and for that reason, I think the job is left undone, and it's really up to libraries, librarians, universities, and governments to build a library over the next 50 years. There's no reason we need this service to be super great in five years, but we should be able to get it in 50 years. And it is going to cost millions of dollars, but if we don't want to spend that money, then we don't really want the thing, right? That's, that's why I mean its, it's viability is, is equal to its desirability. If we really want it, we can really get it. But if we don't get it, it means we didn't want it. Right. See, because, exactly. And Which is why I don't want us to think like consumers. I want us to think like citizens. And that's, believe me, that's what people in uh, the highest levels of university administration are saying right now, too. And that's what especially people who serve on boards of regents and boards of governors at universities are saying, too. Why do we need this acquisition budget in the library? Why do we need this library-based scanning program 
uh, for preservation when Google's got it. That's dangerous, and that actually puts, <laughs> in sort of anti-Google ways, it puts everything on Google servers. You know, Google's, Google interiorly, interior, the interior mind of Google understands the need for redundancy, um, but we're now putting all our chips on Google. Um, and that's because we've got all these folks uh, who aren't necessarily thinking about 50 years down the line, they're thinking about next quarter's budget um, making these decisions. So my job is to get us to think 50 years down the line, ideally. And sure, I might never change a mind, and we might collectively decide it's not worth the effort and not worth the money, and I'm happy with that. What I don't want us to do is say, some of us want it, and at least Google's doing it, because that, I think, is, the, is, is, is a really bad situation. All right, well, I'm out of voice. So thank you very much.